On Sunday the 25th of June, we conducted the C acceptance test of the Nexus 1 rocket and its support systems. So what that means is that we tested out all the systems that are necessary to launch Nexus 1. So we had Nexus 1 on uh, its launch rail on Sputnik. And we had all the electronics set up, the telemetry systems, all the radio communications between Vostok and Sputnik, we had that set up such that we could command the rocket and we could verify that all the systems would uh, work as intended. So now you see the team uh, hoisting next to you to the top of each launch rail. And so here you see Mikey at the top of the, uh, of the launch rail waiting to attach the uh, top launch lock. Next to one is secured to the launch rail with two launch locks. Bottom and one in the top. For the actual launch, these operations we would do in Nexu Harbor, where we would hoist the rocket to the mast the day before launch, and we would check out all the electronic systems once more as a pre launch checkout. On this day, oh. we tested out all the systems and it was Cat Leader Jakob who took charge on all the hardware operations and also leading the, the PAT crew during the simulated launch. So let's just hear Jakob tell about what we actually did on the PAT. We are just uh, doing some of the final preparations that we would also uh, do at sea before, actually in the harbor before we go out to sea on a day of launching the rocket. Right now we have the rocket, it's attached to the launch rail, that's an 11 meter tall rail that will guide the rocket for uh, for the time where it is close to uh, to the launch platform Sputnik. Once it's free of the, uh, the rail, it will be the internal guidance system that is uh, that is taking over and guiding it straight up. Right now we have just uh, we have adjusted the uh, launch flange system, which is basically a flange that will stay on the ship even when the rocket takes off. It uh, contains a number of uh, pneumatic con uh, connectors. Uh, which we use to actually uh, pressurize the tanks by remote. It also contain, contains the uh, perch system, which is a nitrogen line, which would which would uh, eject all the remaining fuel in the rocket engine if we, for some reason, had to abort after opening the main fuel valve. So in this case. The, the only thing actually keeping all those pressure lines open is the, um, is the weight of the rocket. It simply sits on top of these connectors and as soon as the rocket lifts off by its own power, all of these connectors will just shut off. So that's a, a self-contained and self-adjusting system so, uh, so that we can just uh, concentrate on, on getting all the pressures and everything else right. The other thing is that we have just adjusted the load cell, which is a, uh, a device sitting underneath the rocket, right underneath the center line of the rocket. It's actually almost in the exhaust plume. This load cell is currently carrying the entire mass of the rocket. And we're doing this because we need to know exactly how much liquid oxygen we have in the rocket at all times. We have at least four and a half millimeters but, but from... Is... No, that's, that's not... Uh, but we might just try actually and lower it yeah. and let yeah. the rocket rest on it. Martin? This part here is the launch flange. It is designed to be wobbly because it's going to follow the, uh, the movement of the rocket on the rail without having these uh, connections uh, not being sealed all the time. Secondly, we have here in the middle, we have a guide rail or a guideline for the uh, pyrotechnic ignition device, which will be mounted far inside the combustion chamber. Once the uh, ignition process or the combustion process gets going, a, piece, a few pieces of plastic will be melted down here, 
and the pyrotechnic device on a wooden stick will just be ejected from the uh, combustion chamber in between the jet vanes, so not to harm them. This is why this elaborate guide rail system is on here. Also, we have the load cell down here, which through this piece here, it's just slightly lifted the rocket by now, but otherwise it completely rests on this plunger here. The entire mass of the rocket is measured by this load cell at all times. So the whole purpose of the sea acceptance test is to test out that all systems, both on the rocket and on the support ships, are for operational and that they work exactly as intended. We actually ended up doing the sea acceptance test inside the Copenhagen harbor, so exact, not exactly at sea, but it might look like a sunny day, but the waves out at sea were actually a bit, a bit nasty, and also Vostok developed an engine problem during the day. So Vostok was actually not able to, to sail out at sea. In the afternoon, we had gotten all the systems operational and Sputnik set up for sea, but for, for sailing around the Copenhagen harbor, while Vostok was still anchored at the dock. And here you see Ufa at the helm of Sputnik. Sputnik is normally commanded by Gelov, but he was supposed to be the captain of Vostok for this day both for the actual launch and also for the sea acceptance test. The mission control is placed in the uh, below deck on Vostok. So here you see Scott sitting with all these computers, which will control the next We're going to start on the checklist that, uh, that has already been provided by, uh, by flight. And we will see, this is going to be a little bit of hard, so we're going to do exactly as he says. But we have a number of things we need to do. First of all, I would like to have a uh, gas line check so that it's possible we can check that gas comes out of the right lines. I don't want to rupture a burst disc on the fuel tank because we're pressurizing, thinking we're pressurizing the rock tank. A very important part of the sea acceptance test was to do a simulated launch. So what we're doing here is exactly what we'll be doing when we launch the rocket. We fuel it and we also put in a cryogenic liquid. In this case we put in liquid nitrogen because it's inert for launch. We'll of course put liquid oxygen but for safety reasons we like to work with liquid nitrogen when we can do so instead of liquid oxygen. So here you see the team preparing for a for check of gas lines. So for this test, this is nitrogen bottles that we use to pressurize the rocket. And you will see Thomas checking out the operation of the valves. A major part of the checkout is to ensure that all valves are operational. That goes for both the main valves, but also the vent valves. Here you see Thomas uh, leaning against the rocket to, to audibly hear the valves opening and closing. For the sea acceptance test, we also fueled the rocket. So in this uh, metal container, we have about 35 kilos of fuel. And so that would be 75% uh, ethanol, 25% water. And to practice, we load it all in. We simply do that by pressurizing this tank uh, to two or three bars, and then we simply push it into the tank of the next year one. For the sea acceptance test, we also filled the liquid oxygen tank, so we fill it with liquid nitrogen, which is even colder than liquid oxygen, so it's an excellent substitute for a, uh, for a test. Here you see Rune at the nitrogen duo, filling next to one's locks tank with liquid nitrogen. We load it about 35 kilos, and you see everything gets very cold due to the cryogenic properties. We actually ended up filling the tank so much that it spewed out of the uh, vent valve in the, in the top. So at that point we were sure that the, the tank was full. Another very important part of the test is to conduct a, uh, a simulated launch. So here we are doing a countdown. And at zero, you see the main valve for the liquid oxygen in the tank open and spew out the liquid nitrogen. So if this had been the real deal at the uh, sea in uh, Bonhang, then the rocket would have been flying right now. But we can verify that all the systems worked as the countdown reached zero. So all in all, this was an excellent day for us here at Copenhagen Suborbitals. We verified that all these systems of Nexus 1 
are completely operational. Everything behaved as it was supposed to. We practiced loading both, both the fuel tank and the box tank. We practiced pressurizing them with our automatic pressurization system. We uh, observed that the radio tel telemetry works excellent. We had a very high uptime on the radio signal between Vostok and Sputnik. And at all times we could command next to one from the, uh, the terminal. And so based on this, we conclude that the C acceptance test was completely successful. And finally, after this test, we now deem that Nexu-1 is ready to fly. All the auxiliary systems used to launch it are ready. And soon, in a week or two, we'll be in Nexu, sailing out to sea to launch the Nexu-1 rocket.